half of the class of 57 and the College of Engineering, whose dean, Lance Collum, right here in the front row. We We would like to welcome you to this very significant event, the discussion and exposition of the new New York Tech Center by our provost, Kent Fox, and our dean down in New York, Dan Huttenlocker. I'm pleased and honored to introduce Kent and Dan to you this morning. Kent was appointed Cornell's provost effective January 1st, 2009. He served as the Joseph Silbert Dean of Engineering from 2002 to 2008. He was formerly the head of the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Michael J. and Catherine Burke Distinguished Professor at Purdue University from 1996 to 2002. Prior to that appointment, he was a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Coordinated Science Laboratory at the University of Illinois from 1985 to 1996. His research interests focus on computer engineering, particularly dependable computing and failure diagnosis. He is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, and the Association for Computing Machinery and the Association for the Advancement of Science. He has over 185 publications and has served as the thesis advisor for 22 PhD students and 35 MS students. He has received awards for both teaching and research. Kent received a Bachelor of Science of Engineering degree from Duke University a Master of Divinity degree from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and a PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of Illinois. This past year, Kent led the Cornell team effort and proposal to win the pinnacle New York City Tech University Award offered by Mayor Bloomberg and the city. Cornell beat out many fine universities to achieve this monumental win, including Stanford and MIT. Kent's team included Dan Huttenlocker, Lance Collins, and Kathy Dove. Mayor Bloomberg has stated that this entity, once in operation, is intended to surpass Silicon Valley in prowess and importance to the engineering, scientific, entrepreneurial, and financial communities. Here to tell you all about this existing venture for the 21st century is your provost, Kent Fox, and your dean in New York, Dan Huttenlocker. Please welcome them. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, welcome home, everybody. We're glad to see you all. Um, and a special shout out to the class of 57. Uh, almost two years ago when Charlie asked me to, uh, to address the class of 57, this is going to be a different talk. Uh, this is going to be about progress on our strategic plan. So let me give you the uh, two minute version of that talk, if you just bear with me. And it actually is a segue into uh, discussions about this uh, new venture we have in New York City. So in May of uh, 2010, just slightly over two years ago, we completed, with the leadership of eight faculty and about 100 other specific individuals working on task forces, a strategic plan for the university that would lead us from two years ago through the sesquicentennial, this great big 150-year party that we're all working on and planning for and looking forward to. That's that strategic plan, which I'm sure you all have memorized. It's on the web. It's only 78 pages long. Uh, <laughs> urges us to do a number of things. And very simply, it's just building on the excellence of the past 145 years, building on the spectacular excellence of Cornell University that we love. It talks about growing the excellence of the faculty. And we are specifically, this is now my summary of where, what we're doing, 
We have specifically set aside $100 million, $50 million that we are reallocating internally, another $50 million that's part of our capital campaign, to hire new faculty in advance of half of our current faculty. They're going to retire in less than 10 years. Literally half of our current faculty are going to retire in less than 10 years. So we're hiring those new faculty in advance of those retiring. So just to give you an example, over the past two years, we've hired more humanities faculty than any other area uh, at the university, so humanities and the arts. Uh, so we hired 75 new faculty last year. Um, and that's particularly important, as you can imagine, in the midst of the economic downturn, because we can go out and raid faculty from other institutions <laughs> that I won't mention, but uh, ones that we love, but uh, ones in which we're actually taking their faculty, as well as new young faculty. So we're just having spectacular success with, with faculty renewal, important part. It also urged us, that strategic plan, to keep a commitment to students, to invest in students. So we have indeed made a strong commitment that financial aid would be need-based and that admissions would be need-blind. Students now, uh, many, not all of them, but many of our students now have a total cost of attendance because of the generosity of our financial aid that the total cost of attendance now is less than it was even five years ago in the context of all the, the rising costs. So an investment of students. And then thirdly, an investment in the programs and in the infrastructure that makes up Cornell. So for example, we have over the past two years with the leadership of the faculty, the leadership of Harry Katz, the Dean of ILR, and, and Peter Lepage, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, created a single economics department instead of having fragmented economics across the whole institution. So that students across the, uh, the university can study economics in a coherent faculty with a coherent curriculum, with the labor economists from ILR and the economists from the Arts College and other economists from across the institution being in this single, single economics department. Something we've talked about for decades and the faculty now are actually executing and, and making it happen. Really, really exciting. We're also investing, as I said, in sort of the infrastructure, the things that you see when you come back every five years. You'll see cranes uh, on the Agriculture and Life Sciences Quad, totally renovating Warren Hall for our Dyson School, undergraduate business program, applied economics and management, building a new stocking hall for food sciences. We are, you can see construction for the new Gates Hall in information sciences, and we're about to start construction on the first humanities building in almost a century, which will be for humanities uh, attached to Goldwyn Smith, just a spectacular new building. So we're doing all of those things. But the strategic plan also said we need to do something more. And that is that we need to actually grow our worldwide visibility, presence, and impact. Visibility, presence, and impact worldwide. And it urged us specifically to do that in New York City. So Cornell's got programs worldwide. We're in Africa, we're in Italy, you name it, we're, we're there. China, India, et cetera. Uh, but we're also in New York City. And there's a magical historical connection between New York City and Cornell. New York City, some of you are New Yorkers, I'm not. But New York City is a special part of the global uh, worldwide uh, environment. And Cornell, the strategic plan said, needs to have a bigger presence there. But why is that? It's because of the things that I listed, impact, visibility, and the presence can make that happen. And this is true for all our programs. So in other words, the arts, the humanities, the fine arts, the social sciences, business law, as well as applied sciences, we believe, need to have a bigger presence in New York City. In addition to all the spectacular things we're doing here in Ithaca, growing our excellence that we all love and support. So in De on December 16th, December 16th, 2010, Mayor Bloomberg announced, and it was in the New York Times, that he was starting a new land-grant opportunity. And that new land-grant opportunity would be in New York City. The city would offer land. The city would offer $100 million. And it inv he was inviting, at that point, a little over a year ago, universities from around the world to submit uh, applications, submit proposals for creating an applied sciences campus that would bring together disciplines that would educate students that would then stay in New York City 
and either be part of a technology environment that was there already with existing companies or start new companies and actually create a new economy for New York City that the city has not been known for. It's been known for all the other things we love about New York City, but it has not been known yet. It's changing quickly, but not yet, the technology environment. Uh, so that was December 16th, 2010. On December 16th, 2011, President Scorton got a call saying Cornell had won, won the competition. Uh, now there was a lot of drama, a lot of hard work, a lot of competition with Stanford and a few other places uh, in the midst of all of that, and also the spectacular gift of Chuck Feeney of $350 million that made all of that happen. But it was literally 365 days from the day it was announced, the competition, to the day that President Scorton got the call saying that Cornell had won 11 acres on Roosevelt Island, that Cornell had won the $100 million and that Cornell now would indeed begin to fulfill what our faculty had urged us to do two years ago, and that is to build our presence. Not across all the disciplines yet, but this is one big first step to doing that. So what I'm gonna now do is ask the, the new dean of this campus, uh, and also the vice provost, uh, an appointment that we made in January and February of this year, the founding dean of the campus, Dan Huttenlocker, to come up. So, so Dan, could you come up? So, so Dan has, Dan has already been a dean before this. Dan's been leading what we call the Faculty of Computing and Information Sciences. Uh, and Dan's going to walk us through, he's going to show you some pictures, and then we're going to actually open it up for Q&A. Uh, and we're, we're still taking advice on, on the campus, uh, or anything else you would like to have. So Dan? So it's great to be here today. I just took the late campus to campus bus up last night from New York to Ithaca. It was full of a lot of people heading to reunion actually, but not quite this many because the bus only seats 32 people. Uh, so um, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about some of where we're at uh, with the tech campus and the development of the tech campus and a little bit of the background. Uh, I'm not going, going to go through, there's a fair amount of material out there already about the competition phase and I really view this as more of an update about where we are. Um, so, uh, so we're really trying to build a campus for the technology economy of the 21st century. That's the goal, front and center. When you look at the nation's challenges in creating high quality jobs over the last five years or so, one of the few bright spots is actually the technology sector. For those of you who don't sort of follow what's going on in fields like computer science, electrical engineering, information science. Let me just give you a little bit of background. This year in computer science, which is the one department I happen to know the statistics for, our graduating bachelor's students starting salaries were approaching $100,000 a year with a bachelor's degree. And they had about this many job offers, <laughs> as opposed to the big goose egg. So, there's a huge demand right now in this country, and it's a demand that has existed through the whole dot-com bust when all of a sudden everybody stopped majoring in these majors because they thought all the jobs were gonna go overseas and they didn't. There's this huge need for people who have the technical training to drive the knowledge economy forward. And that's really what this campus is about. It's about attracting the very, very best faculty and then the very, very best students to New York City for graduate level education and research programs. We're not creating undergraduate programs in New York. We're creating graduate level programs. We believe strongly in the, you know, the broad undergraduate multi-college experience that we offer here in Ithaca. Uh, that's not something we plan to replace. Although there will be opportunities for undergraduates on the New York campus, much like you know, we have things like Cornell in Rome and Cornell in Washington in the architecture and in the uh, politics areas. We will have, over time, Cornell in New York City for undergraduates in these areas. But the real focus and the degrees are at the graduate level. So this is about creating a campus for the, for the 21st century for the technology-driven economy. And one of the things um, that I think is particularly exciting about this opportunity right now is that New York is, I think, the best place to be doing this in the world. Because the technology economy is shifting. 
So, you know, it'd be great to bring Cornell to New York to try to turn things around if that was what we needed to do. But my confidence in our ability, as wonderful as this institution is, to really turn things around is low. But things are, because any institution, like New York is this huge economy, but the New York economy is already heading in a direction, and it's a direction that the whole national and global technology economy is heading in, which is there's a fundamental shift in technology today away from what I like to call sort of tech for tech's sake, right? Technology designed by technologists with relatively little input from the rest of us. Um, much more towards technology where there's very deep and early engagement of customers and users in the development of the technology. Doesn't mean that there aren't fundamentally hard technological problems to solve there, there are. But increasingly it's done in partnership with the people who will be using the technology. And New York is already the capital of commerce and culture in almost every area you can think of. And so, as technology starts to shift towards this deep partnership between technologists and everybody else, New York is the, it's the leadership of everybody else. And so as we bring more and more technology talent to New York, this thing is going to catch fire and take off. And it already is on its own. My sort of poster child example, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of a, a company called Etsy, which is in Dumbo over in Brooklyn. They're, um, they're a crafts trading site, right? And so you stop and you think, Crafts, New York City, what, you know, maybe the Pacific Northwest, maybe Northern New England, Vermont, something, but crafts in New York. I mean, this is sort of, but the thing about New York is that you can find a passionate community of early adopters in almost any area, including crafts. <laughs> and they're right there and they're in your face. And so when you go to Etsy's headquarters, in fact, in Dumbo, in Brooklyn, um, they have regular engagement of their leading users right there in the office, and that's been true since the beginning of the firm. So really, almost any area, New York City is going to be the place to be developing technology. Now, technology development's also becoming much more global. And so we have this great partnership uh, with the Technion, uh, the Israeli Institute of Technology, in what we're calling the Technion Cornell Innovation Institute, which is a key part of this new campus. It brings a global view. And frankly, right now, there are only two countries in the world where there's real academic leadership in these technology areas and real commercial leadership. And that's the United States and Israel. And so this is a partnership between the only two nations in the world that have real academic excellence and real commercial excellence in technology. And it's something that's a very exciting piece of this campus. So, that kind of gets to, to, to me what's the really critical aspect of this. And you know, as, as I'm looking at building this new campus, this thing is a startup. It's a startup that happens to be inside a university in partnership with a government, which is about as big a problem as you could imagine in some ways, <laughs> since, uh, since startups need to be nimble and universities are completely lumbering and the only thing more lumbering than university is a government. But, um, but it's also, you know, it's an exciting opportunity. And, and, and I think that anyone who started a new business or a new anything will recognize this. The culture that you set up in some new entity as you get it off the ground is incredibly important. And so our culture on this new campus in New York City needs to be a culture of Cornell, but also a culture that is much more commercial than the Ithaca culture, than the traditional Cornell culture here in Ithaca. In Ithaca. And in fact, we're looking at this as combining the academic leadership and excellence that we know at Cornell, or maybe even raising the bar on that as hard as it is, together with real commercial success and societal impact of technology and bringing those together. So it's really three cultures that have been relatively disparate in the world that we're planning to bring together into one culture. That's our challenge, but it's also our opportunity. And as we look at recruiting the first faculty for this new campus, the idea that we could even potentially succeed in bringing those three cultures together is an incredibly exciting recruiting tool for some, some really leading faculty. Um, and just to sort of emphasize that this isn't a business as usual campus, in fact, our first hire on the academic program side is not a traditional academic, is not a traditional tenured professor. Uh, it's a guy named Greg Pass, who was until fairly recently the CTO of Twitter. Um, he's a serial software entrepreneur. 
And he's going to be relocating to New York next month to help us set up all of the entrepreneurship programs uh, and to bring the entrepreneurial uh, technology mindset to things as, as we develop the academic programs. So I'm really excited to have him on board. And a lot about this campus, because it's at the graduate level, is about mentorship and apprenticeship. So for example, every student on this campus, in addition to a faculty advisor or mentor, will have an industry mentor from a local company. And that's something that we think is a very important aspect of the programs. All right, so those were lots of words. I'm mainly going to go to pictures. So one of the key things is to take the disciplines as we know them and tie them to the broader context in which commercial development happens, right? As much as I'm a passionate person about computer science, the discipline that I've been working in for about 30 years now, um, I recognize from time that I've spent in industry that the academic view of computer science, while important to industrial success, is alone nowhere near enough. That the academic disciplines are actually very narrow compared to, narrow and deep, compared to what's necessary to build businesses. And so as we look at um, the organization of this campus, the departments that we all know and love and recognize will be present there, but the organization of the campus will be different. And the way I like to talk about this is that academic departments exist for centuries or millennia, right? I, I'm in a very new discipline, computer science. It's half a century old, right? If you think of physics or mathematics or philosophy, really, I mean, these are sort of millennia old fields in, in, in many ways. And so the organization of this campus will be around interdisciplinary focal areas that we're calling hubs that will have lifetimes that are more measured in years and decades. And the first three of these are in three areas that we believe are very important to industry in New York. Uh, what we're calling connective media, which is the sort of interactive media, healthier life, and this is technology for healthier life. So it's not all of the life sciences, it's the sort of technology component, uh, and the built environment. So things like uh, you know, being able to build and retrofit buildings that are smarter and green. When we sort of blow up these three hubs, uh, the connective media, healthier life and built environment, all of the, you know, there's a huge range of academic disciplines, literally two dozen of them that are relevant to pulling this campus off. There is a set at the core here, which are relatively technical plus sort of uh, business and economics. And when we look at the degrees that we'll be offering in New York City, there will be an initial core set of graduate degrees in these uh, disciplines that are at the focal point plus a very innovative new uh, Masters of Science program that we're developing jointly with the Technion that'll be a dual degree program that will award both Cornell and Technion degrees that will be organized around these hubs. And that dual degree program will both combine the technical expertise and the expertise in the related areas. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about where we're going to be which is Roosevelt Island, and a little bit about the schedule for getting there. So 2017, five years from now, is when we plan to open the first academic building on Roosevelt Island. We plan to get the lease from the city for the property by the end of 2013, then demolish the buildings that are currently there in 2014, begin construction, and move in in 17. Since the whole purpose of this campus is tech entrepreneurship, from an entrepreneur's point of view, you know, next fall is far away. Five years from now is infinity. Forget about it. So this is wonderful. It's using a lot of our time in planning uh, and in working with the city government and, and, and all kinds of agencies uh, in getting this planned out. But we're starting this fall. And we're starting this fall in space that Google's providing for us free of rent in the building that they own uh, in Chelsea uh, at 111 8th Avenue. Some of you may know it as the old Port Authority building down there. It was built as a truck warehouse. Uh, it's about a 15-story tall building. It's almost 3 million square feet. It's one of the largest buildings in New York. It's the entire city block between 8th and 9th and 15th and 16th. Uh, we'll be starting with 22,000 square feet in there uh, next month, growing to close to 60,000 um, by uh, 2016. And then in 2017, we'll move to Roosevelt Island. This is a spectacular gift, uh, the value of which is uh, between 10 and $12 million. Uh, this is not, um, as somebody I was talking to the other day said, uh, th th this is not the kind of gift in kind where someone's trying to 
shove something off their loading dock whose value is close to zero and get a tax credit for the full amount, <laughs> right? I mean, real estate in this area of New York is going up and up and up in price. Chelsea's really hot. A lot of tech companies there. Um, you know, this is not empty space. This is uh, a, a, a corporate citizen really sort of squeezing themselves to fit us into that building, uh, and, and we're very, very appreciative of it. So, um, so this is just showing that building and, and some of the kind of space that we'll have in that building. So it's a very open kind of floor plan, fairly different from most academic environments, fairly different from some corporate environments. I'm not going to have an office there as the dean and vice provost of this campus. I'm going to have a desk out in one of these open areas. So we're going to try to set a new culture, new ways of interacting. Um, this is uh, David Scorton together with uh, Google CEO Larry Page at the press conference a couple weeks ago announcing the space. And this is the building there. So we're really excited about, uh, about that location for the next five years. And again, since I'm heading a startup, that's infinity for me, right? I can't <laughs> think beyond that. So this is Roosevelt Island, um, where, uh, where, we're, where the, the site uh, of our new campus is. So this is the uh, Queensboro Bridge here. Um, this is just south of the bridge. So for those of you uh, who've been on the tram here, the tram just runs just north of the bridge. The F train uh, also stops here uh, and runs down through the middle of Manhattan, down 6th Avenue. This entire site, for, so this is a sports complex, uh, tennis bubble and, and, and so forth here. From just south of the sports complex down to the bottom here where this is now uh, Parkland and what will be the new FDR memorial. This entire uh, approximately 12 acre site uh, is the land grant that Kent mentioned that, 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 that we're receiving. Um, and so, you know, as I said, the first order of business starting in 2014 will be to remove this approximately 650,000 square feet of 1920s era buildings that uh, have been sort of, you know, maintained in the standards of a government agency since then. In other words, <laughs> they kind of need to come down, um, or they're coming down on their own, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and then over a 30-year time period, we will, on this site, build between 1.8 and 2.1 million square feet. So about three times what's on the site right now. We're starting up near the north end, and the, the first buildings will be an academic building and a corporate R&D building that will be directly adjacent to the academic building, and that'll be 300,000 square feet that's opening up in, in 2017. So the, the initial piece of what we're building will be sort of a little less than um, about 40% or you know, a third to 40% of what's there, but it'll be way up on, on the northern end. So this just shows the view from there. If, you have, if, if you're a New Yorker and you haven't been out to Roosevelt Island, which is 99 and 44 one hundredths of uh, percent of all New Yorkers, unless you play tennis, I've discovered pretty much no one's been out there. Uh, but um, this is the view from just uh, above. So basically, this is at that sports complex that's just north of, of our site, looking back towards the UN's kind of obscured by those trees there. It's just this is a spectacular site. It's a site that we're referring to as a river-to-river -river site because it you know, really goes from sort of one part of the East River to the other. And it's, you know, it's going to be just a spectacular set of buildings there. Unbelievably inspiring place for people to come and to work and to really be a, a magnet for the technology community in, in New York more broadly. So uh, the last thing I just wanted to say is the architect we picked to design the first academic building is Tom Main uh, and his firm Morphosis. We're actually working with them right now on a project, which is if you've seen the big hole in the ground there uh, up, up on this campus um, next to Barton Hall and, uh, and Hoy Field, that's Gates Hall, um, generously supported by, by a gift from uh, the Gates Foundation. Uh, that building uh, they designed will be completed uh, about 18 months from now. Uh, it's already, they're starting to, I saw the concrete buckets there today, which is a big step from pulling the dirt out of the ground. Uh, they also designed the Cooper Union Building in New York, Perot Museum in Dallas. These are sort of examples of their work. It's very 21st century looking architecture, and this is a 21st century campus. So we're, we're really happy to have them uh, in, engaged in the design. So with that, I think we'll open it up for questions. And whoever's running the clock will just have to tell and, us. And, and Kent will answer all the hard questions, and I'll, I'll take the, the nice, slow softball pitches. Glad to do it. <laughs> I should just start by saying that uh, 
my dear friend Tony Cashin came up to me before we started and uh, gave uh, me what any provost thinks is the highest compliment. He said, uh, Kent, you're looking thinner. <laughs> <laughs> so any compliments? What's really happening is his eyesight's fading. But, <laughs> but, uh, but any compliments we take him. So, yeah, I think we'll, particularly about my way. If you're going to move the graduate engineering and others to New York, how, is, how are you going to deal with the drain on TAs and the research that undergraduates could have been involved with here in education? So, um, so what we're doing in New York, and I should have said this more explicitly, is not moving anything. In fact, I think almost no faculty will move from Ithaca. Um, you know, one of the things about the strength of our engineering and computing sciences programs uh, in Ithaca is that the faculty here could be anywhere in the world, right? These are not faculty who are somehow trapped in Ithaca and wish they were living in New York City. Um, and what the New York campus will allow us to do is attract a kind of faculty member who wants to be more deeply engaged in commercial development so faculty who really want to do basic research, we're not going to hire them at the New York campus. The mission of the New York campus is bridging academic excellence to commercial development. You don't want to work on commercial development, you don't belong there. So it really has a distinct mission, and one that broadens the, the, the Cornell mission in engineering and, 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 and the computing sciences. Because you know, as wonderful as the spin-out companies from Cornell are that are here in Tompkins County, and as important as they are to the, to the county economy with you know, employing thousands of people, actually. All right, I'm going to be a total geek and say there's a huge impedance mismatch between <laughs> the scale of Cornell University's ability to produce companies in these areas and the scale of a 100,000-person population in Tompkins County to absorb them. And so really what we're doing by building a campus in New York City in this area is attracting a new kind of faculty member and, frankly, a new kind of student while absolutely remaining totally committed to what we're doing in Ithaca. And just as a footnote, and maybe I'll let Lance speak to this too, but I want to steal his thunder first, <laughs> which is you know, our yield for freshmen in engineering this year is higher than it's been in years. And I don't think it's uncorrelated. It would be hard to argue it's uncorrelated with all the publicity we've gotten around this campus in New York City. I think this is something where as a management team, we have to be very careful to make sure that it's additive. But if we work on making sure that it's additive, this is going to be a huge win for these areas of the university in Ithaca, in New York, and I actually think more broadly for the institution. Because institutional reputation and brand are things that are sticky. And so you know, the amount of coverage that we're getting, and I think we'll continue to get around this campus, I believe has a halo effect for the whole institution. Yeah, this this uh, issue or concept of, of uh, um, you know, possibility of the campus competing with Ithaca is one we're just really, really focused on in the sense of this is growth for the institution. Uh, this is the whole purpose of this campus, the new campus, is to help Ithaca, to actually help Ithaca. So the way I describe it, very simply, is that uh, no Ithaca resources are going to New York City. Uh, the goals that every dean has for their college has not changed, and that includes their campaign goals. Uh, they're actually going up, not down, because of this. So it's, it's really a, uh, an additive growth to the whole institution. And, and I think that's really the, the way it should be, should help all of us. So. Hi. All kinds of hands up. So who, who has, who, whoever has actually, the mic? Actually, I have the mic. Okay. Hi. <laughs> You, so, you, you win. <laughs> we have a question. We are live streaming this event through Alumni Affairs. The social media team is. So we have a question from our live stream audience. It's from Ward Naughton. What do you feel will really be required to achieve the tech development success that Stanford has had with the Silicon Valley? And what improvements need to be made to Cornell Tech Transfer? So I'm, I'm going to answer the improvement part, because I'm really not about imitating other institutions, regardless of what kind of reputation they might have in a particular field. I think we're going to do this the Cornell way, and we're going to be very successful doing it the Cornell way, and it's going to be distinctive. <laughs> so you know, I think that what's most important about New York is taking advantage of how tech can succeed in New York. There are a number of people around the world who've tried to sort of quote unquote copy Silicon Valley, 
Those have all been failures or very minor successes. And part of it is because there are ecosystems in any area, right? There are people with different skills, different desires, different interests in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. And so to transplant something that works in one place to another place almost invariably doesn't work. The thing that we think is most important about making tech work in New York is, is, is really what I, I focused on in the first slide or two, which is building these very strong, broadly interdisciplinary connections between technology, academic expertise, and academic expertise in other areas. So just to give a, a concrete example, in the connective media area, we're going to have computer scientists and electrical engineers and information scientists working with sociologists and psychologists and right I'm not saying interdisciplinary like a computer scientist working with a mechanical engineer right okay that's interdisciplinary but come on you know <laughs> they all took the same you know freshman and sophomore classes and then split off into something else this is very broadly interdisciplinary and that's what's crucial to this new generation of technology development and that's also where New York has a huge edge so I don't know if, if, if you've been sort of following the, the press lately, but New York is now the second largest place in the country in terms of venture capital investment in tech. For eight successive quarters now, we've been the second largest in New York City after any other metro area, from having been essentially non-existent a decade ago. Um, and uh, you know, I think that much of that investment is because of this opportunity to bring together other commercial areas with the technology area. And so that's the whole approach we're going to take on this campus. We're going to have broad interdisciplinary research and development to feed into this connectivity between tech and other areas uh, um, in the commercial sector. So that's something that I think we're going to do that's very different um, and something that we think will be a real success in New York. And just speaking on the national level, I think it will help us build uh, a more diverse set of approaches to technology development and technology job creation in the country, right? I think the Valley is great for what it does well. I think Boston is great for what it does well, which these days is mainly life sciences technology, frankly. But as a nation, we need more and more technology hubs. It's where a lot of the high quality job growth is happening and we're gonna take advantage of what's unique about Cornell and what's unique about New York and build an ecosystem that's different from the others. Dan, right here. Hi, I'm Phil Mackendu, class of 57. In all that you've been talking about, I think I've seen around the edges the answer to this question, but I would like you to address it specifically. My career began with Stroger step-by-step -step switches in communications engineering. Uh, there is now in the graphics engine of an iPad more switching capability than in any telephone central office, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, I call this the technology stampede. How are you going to address that in your academic programs so that we're looking for what's coming down the track and not just keeping what we've got working? Yep, so, so there's something that we talk about um, that we call the virtuous cycle of interaction between academic programs and companies that are located near the academic programs, right? It's not just that the academic programs produce ideas and students and feed into the companies. It's a cycle. Things cycle back from the companies into the academic programs. Today's challenges cycle back from the companies into the academic programs. To the degree to which these companies are nearby and their regular daily, in daily interactions, for example, employees of the company coming to mentor students on the campus, that takes that cycle and makes it much stronger than it is if you're not directly working with companies nearby. And so that is something that we feel that for the commercial side of these uh, master's programs, you know, I think undergraduate curricula vary more slowly for a real reason, frankly. Um, you know, you, you don't want to respond to every fad out there. In industry. An undergrad degree is supposed to teach you how to think for the next you know, many decades of your life. A master's degree is more focused on a professional training that's maybe relevant for the next five or six years and then you better keep learning along the way. So for these master's degrees, um, that, this feedback from companies, this uh, having a, a, a sort of a flock of industry mentors on campus is something that we think will really build a very strong virtuous cycle. It's something that we think is very, very important. 
Hi, I'm James Mason. Uh, hi, I hear you saying that there will be more focused, there'll be more of a focus on applied research than pure research. So should those of us just completing PhDs look forward to a lot of postdoc opportunities in the new tech campus? Yeah, so I mean, de definitely as a graduate level campus, um, postdoctoral training is certainly a piece of what we will be doing. So it'll be master's, PhD, and postdoc level. Um, you know, I think that I've learned to be a little allergic to the description of applied research. Um, because I think often in the academic world, when you put applied in front of something, it's a euphemism for not quite first rate. Um, and uh, it, it uh, or at least many academics view it that way. So we're, we're trying to be careful to talk about commercial relevance and commercial ties and not necessarily talk about how basic or how applied the research is. Um, so I, I, I don't want to characterize this as a sort of, and, and, and the whole sort of applied sciences initiative, which is the way City Hall describes it, I, I'm a little allergic to the applied word. Um, and, uh, but I, I think it's in, you know, there will be opportunities from, you know, sort of undergraduate programs, but not degrees, all the way up through postdocs for people who want to take their technical knowledge, grow it, and tie it more closely to commercial reality. Um, Lee Rosenbaum, class of 70. Uh, following up on the postdoc question, can you give a little more flavor as to how, where, who you're recruiting for faculty? Are you going to non, are you just going to other universities? Are you going to um, recently minted PhDs who are doing other things? Uh, and, and where are you doing this? Can you, can you give us some flavor of sure, that? Sure, sure. So the, the faculty recruiting hop opportunities here right now um, really look amazing. And you know, the thing about faculty recruiting or any recruiting is it ain't over till it's over and it's not over yet. So we'll see how we actually deliver on this. But we've made a decision that for the tenure track faculty hires in New York, for the foreseeable future, those will be senior people. We're not hiring assistant professors into tenure track jobs. And the reason is that an assistant professor has six years to prove that they have the education and, and research chops to get tenure. And to do that in a chaotic startup environment, I can't look a fresh PhD in the eyes and tell them straight, this is the best place for you to do that. It's gonna to be total chaos there for the first few years, that I promise. <laughs> so I, you know, I expect that it will, you know, if I had to predict, I expect it's gonna be at least five years actually before we hire fresh minted PhDs into tenure track jobs. Um, so we're looking at people at the associate and full professor level tenured and people who um, are academic superstars for their rank, but who have demonstrated commercial uh, impact or interests or success or interests or impact in the societal applications of technology. So for example, one of the things that we're gonna be very focused on on this campus is the 1.1 million children in the New York City public school system and the incredible lack of, not just in New York City, but around the country of a reasonable educational preparation for students in sciences and mathematics and technology starting you know, at least middle school, maybe even a little earlier, up through high school and community college. So we want faculty not who, you know, as a tenured professor, are gonna go teach in a high school, but whose research and uh, whose commitment is to helping develop the programs that can be used at those levels. Um, so, so we're really looking for faculty who bridge academic excellence with either commercial impact or societal impact. And so far, that um, is attracting some incredibly interesting people. People who do raise the bar on the quality of this campus, and that is a very hard bar to raise. Am I on now? Yeah. Uh, the college, uh, the uh, Cornell alumni Club of the Greater Capital District, which is Albany, New York, uh, not long ago toured the College of Nanoscale Science at U Albany, and uh, it seems to me that the concept you described is very similar 
to that concept which we observed at U Albany in that industry and academic people are integrated and work together. They have a clean room that's the size of a football field, which has academic work areas and industry work areas. And of course, that's uh, provided a boom to the economy of the Hudson Valley, which is now called Tech Valley. So my, my question is, is that in any way a model for what you're doing? And I just want to add, uh, apropos of the previous question, we uh, met two or three Cornell PhDs on the faculty there, and you might want to look into seeing whether you can lure them. <laughs> So, so, so there are a number of these kinds of centers, um, both around the state and around the country, that work to bring uh, ac academics and industry closer together. And so we're learning from a bunch of them uh, about what they do that we think is appropriate and will work on our new campus and what won't. And the details are probably too much for an answer here, so I'll just say that, that we're looking at a bunch of these programs, including that. Um, the focus, though, in New York City, as Kent said, is uh, really on attracting and retaining people who will create or work at businesses in the five boroughs. And so that means that our focus is largely on sort of software and information and not on things like nanoscale science. Anything where you'd have to build a large fabrication facility doesn't make it makes plenty of sense in the capital region, a lot of land that's cheap. Doesn't make sense in New York where land is incredibly expensive. Um, and so the focus here is, is largely on, 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 a, on a sort of separate set of disciplines. And that's actually important, back to the earlier question about sort of what's additive versus duplicative between this new campus and our other campuses on the Upper East Side and, and here, which is that, so, Biotechnology and nanotechnology are things that as an institution, Cornell has already invested a lot in. Biotech, we're building this multi-hundred million dollar building uh, uh, down, down uh, at the medical campus. Here we have a, a great uh, nanofabrication facility here in Duffield Hall. Um, and so we're really not looking at duplicating those kinds of facilities in New York, but rather fo focusing on, on the software side. Oh, good morning. Uh, my name is Denise Francis. Uh, I'm probably one of the few people that know where Dumbo is in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say the two best things happening to New York City right now is obviously Cornell New York City Tech and obviously the New York Brooklyn Nets <laughs> for those basketball fans. I also like to say I'm a graduate of 83 electrical engineering. I did fiber optics thanks to Cornell, a master's degree and I had the opportunity to commercialize a number of products uh, in the fiber optic area. So I think you're right on track, and I commend you for the work you're doing. The one thing I would say is as Cornell alumni, we should get a lot more involved in the process, and I would say in particular, the commercialization process. I mean, a lot of us have spent a lot of time in the academia, but it's not an easy thing for small business to transition from a product to a marketplace. So fortunately, over the past 10 years, that's essentially what I've done, um, working with numerous companies, including United Technologies. So one, one thing I would look, like to say, um, I'm here with a group of Cornell Black, um, um, CBA, the Cornell Black alumni, and represent, represent people from all the top major companies, Dell, Microsoft, um, especially in the computing area, that we need to rely on some of the, uh, our resources right here in this room. I'm going to be at the Phillips Electrical Engineering Hall tomorrow morning for breakfast and see how we can help with the commercialization. It's one thing having a product that sits on the shelf. It's another thing getting into the marketplace. And it takes a little more than just engineering knowledge to do that. So I just want to wish you luck in your endeavor. I've dealt with a lot of startups, and I look forward to being very successful. Well, thank yeah, you. Th thanks, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, right here. Let's see if I can get this. Hello? Is it working? Yep. OK, Frank Burke, uh, Arts and Sciences class of 72, currently living in California. So pretty familiar with the kind of the tech cycle in both northern and southern California. You haven't really mentioned very much of what the view is on the, sort of the commercial side. You've talked a lot about the academic side. But if you, when you know about the venture cycle, I'm curious, are you looking for incubator type companies that are actually going to come into the space and be incubated or some companies that are sort of in that 
uh, venture cycle, not quite public yet, or micro caps or uh, large caps, or wh where are you focused to get the, you know, the, the innovation implanted, if you will? So the answer is sort of all of the above, um, but but let me try to to um, put some color on that. So the uh, so the reason I'm Focusing on the academic side is because I'm an academic. And I'm an academic who's worked in industry enough. I both founded a startup company and I worked in R&D at Xerox Corporation for about a decade um, to know that I'm a B minus commercialization person. And I'd like to think of myself as a lot better than a B minus academic. So, um, so I sort of know enough to know that what the university does should be come from the academic side aimed at bridging this huge gap between the academic and the commercialization side. And then we need the right people coming from the commercial side in the other direction. So somebody like Greg Pass, who has great commercial credentials, and having him as a university employee is a piece of what we're going to do uh, what we are already doing to come from the academic side toward the commercial side. And then we will have a set of companies at all kinds of scales from, you know, the sort of, you know, two guys and a dog kind of company up to, um, you know, the, 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 the global multinationals. And the, the thing that's really important for us in building those relationships is that those are companies that commit to really spending time and having personnel on the campus, right? This is something that we are doing in New York and about New York. So that's why we're building this uh, corporate uh, co-location building. And we expect that to have R&D activities from big companies as well as sort of incubator and accelerator spaces for small companies. But we don't expect to get into the business of operating companies, of you know, making individual investment decisions in companies, of running accelerators or incubators. We know enough to know that we would do a lousy, we would do a lousy job of that. Wouldn't even be a B minus. Could, could you approach it from validating the logic of a startup? Because addressing the private equity market is like a stone wall. They have NIH big time, not invented. <coughs> so if you had a reverse mentoring process where a startup company, I'm medical, technical, or whatever, and with the ability to look at it and say, this makes sense. Yeah, so I mean, allow the yep. investment banker or somebody to find, target the right money source. Yeah, so you know, one of the goals of having a lot of, a lot of non academics on the campus, having these industry mentors engaged is not just bringing the industry perspective to the students and the faculty, but also bringing the entrepreneurial uh, perspective from the students who are the primary entrepreneurs on a campus. Us faculty tend to be less entrepreneurial. Some of us are entrepreneurial, but not most. Um, to bring that viewpoint back in the other direction. Now, you know, one thing is New York now is, does actually have a pretty good early stage uh, seed and venture <coughs> marketplace. Um, there are a lot of both national and local firms. And as I was saying before, the venture investing uh, in New York now is, 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 is second in the country. Now, on the one hand, that's big. On the other hand, if you look at the size of New York City's economy compared to any other metro area, um, Maybe not as impressive as it as it could or should be, but 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 part of the cultural changes that we want to um, help uh, engender are not just cultural changes on our campus, but cultural changes in the tech community in New York. Yeah, I'm Chuck Thawdy, uh, 57 mechanical engineering, and I'm a retired Silicon Valley executive. I have over 30 years of experience in uh, electronics and computing manufacturing and design. And one thing I think you sort of glossed over, but you talked about a little while ago, is the link between the design and the manufacturing, especially how to get more manufacturing in the US. I ran assembly factories in Taiwan. So I, I think you really have to expand more 
on the link between conceptualization, design, and manufacturing. And I didn't really hear you talking about faculty in that area. Yep, and, and, and that's partly because the, the, this, you know, everything needs a focus, and the focus of this campus is largely on software and information. There will be manufacturing components, but the kinds of product development things that we'll be supporting will be ones where most of the value is not coming from the manufacturing part. And that's because in New York's, our mission, our land, we have a land grant, right? We have hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer resources from the city of New York. Our mission in that land grant is to generate jobs in New York City. So I think Cornell University more broadly, I'm absolutely with you. That's something the university is engaged in, should be more engaged in, but it won't be a big focus on the tech campus in New York City. Um, and I, I want another play there. Uh, as an institution, yes, but it, it, you know, it, look, it's a startup. If you don't focus, you fail. And I'm just going to invoke the, the focus thing. It's just we, we have to stay focused. We have to stay focused on delivering jobs in New York City. So we're, we're at 11 o'clock, so I'm going to uh, bring this to an end. I'm, I'm actually going to ask Lance Collins, who's the Dean of Engineering, just to make some real brief comments, and then I'll conclude us and, uh, uh, and then dismiss the class. So Lance, so so thanks, Ken. I just I just really wanted. I, I've heard a couple of questions about uh, the Ithaca campus that 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 made me think. I, I just wanted to say a couple of words. So one thing, I couldn't be, and our college couldn't be more excited about this. Um, we understand, you know, that there's that this is an extension, but we see it as a really important complement to what we, what we already do extremely well on, on this campus, the discovery-based research, the, um, you know, looking at even these issues about manufacturing, that's something that we're actually looking at on this campus. Um, but this is kind of giving us this other compliment. This, this, is creating a, this is creating something that really, I think, is unique in the world, in which we've got this urban-rural campus where there's this frenetic energy in the city, uh, and yet a place to come in Ithaca where you can get away from that if you, if you so choose, or maybe you just want to be in one space or the other. The point is that you have this incredible complement. And I, to me, I think that's kind of creating something really, really unique. The second thing is that um, we think we train students here at the undergraduate level that are going to be perfect uh, students on this graduate campus that if, they, if they're interested in, in commercialization and entrepreneurship. Because we already have um, a curriculum that is more than just technical. And really, I think you guys are representatives of that. Your success are examples of that. Um, that we train students that really have um, a sort of broader perspective, a sense of, uh, you know, we have a, a business minor for our students that's new, leadership a program that's under development, project teams that really give students a sense of what it's like to be in an entrepreneurial world Kessler Fellows that puts them into startup companies. We have an enormous number of programs that are really preparing students, in some sense, to enter this campus. It wasn't by intent, but, in, but the, the, the sense of complement between these two campuses is just tremendous. So uh, while we, we understand all of this is, you know, this is a, a, a heavy lift, we are mostly incredibly excited because we're, we think we're, we're gonna create something that no other campus in the, in the world can do. Um, and I just wanted to get a sense of that, that sense of enthusiasm on behalf of, the, of, of my colleagues in engineering. Thanks. So what, uh, what Lance has described could be echoed across many, many of the academic deans. Uh, so Cornell is really fortunate in having spectacular founding leadership. Uh, I think you can tell from just hearing Dan speak about how how uh, gifted he is in being this founding dean and vice provost. We've got something similar in another, yep. And on the operational side, there's a whole spectacular team as well, just leading it. Uh, I think you're gonna get a sense today, and then tomorrow when you hear President Scorton give his State of the University address that Cornell's on the move. Good things are happening, and we're so glad and fortunate to have you all back and be a part again, of uh, the community. Thanks for listening to us. Take care.
Chris, how are you? Good to see you again. Good to see you. You're like the two guys in the dog. Uh, we're, we're three guys in the dog. Yeah, we're three guys in the dog. So I, I kind of figured that was close enough. So. Yeah, close enough. That was worth it. You might have time. Actually, all three of us are former friends. Good luck to you. Yeah, good luck. Nice to meet you. We'll, we'll, we'll see you around. If you're CRC, you'll be seeing us for years. <laughs> John, what's your left hand? You're